Lori Vallow's attorneys moved to dismiss the death penalty because we don't kill witches anymore. Alec Murdoch's older brother doesn't believe his brother, Alec Murdoch. Letitia's Stout trial is set to get underway. Not guilty by reason of insanity. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Well, three of them actually. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. Hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can download any of our Crime Talk episodes on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right. Let's support the people that support Crime Talk. Go to crimetalksearch.com. When you sign up for that background subscription service, you are going to be able to search as many people as you would like to get as much information as you potentially desire. You're going to get information as to whether they are married, whether they are divorced, whether they have a criminal history. Are they on a public registry of some type, if you know what I mean? Are they married? Are they single? Hmm. Are they being honest with you? Go check them out. Go to crimetalksearch.com. Sign up for that background subscription service today. And remember, as many searches as you want, and you can cancel at any time. All right, let's move on to the docket for March 7th, 2023. Let's go ahead and open the record. First on the docket, we don't kill witches anymore. All right, the attorneys for Lori Vallow have filed another motion to dismiss the death penalty in her case. Why? Didn't they already have motions on that? Yes, but according to Lori Vallow's attorney, James Archibald and John Thomas, the court hasn't ruled on those motions. And you do know we have a jury trial commencing here next month, literally about a month away uh, for Lori Vallow. Remember her husband, Chad Daybell, they have been severed and um, they're going to be separate trials now, which is a good thing, I think, for everybody. Really, it is. Anyway, so according to the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment, which include due process, cruel and unusual punishment, and equal protection under the United States Constitution, as well as the applicable state equivalent sections of their Idaho State Constitution, now the defense has moved to dismiss the death penalty. Why, you may ask? First reason, the media saturation of this case still persists. The nonstop articles about this case and the rehashing of the arguments in each hearing continue to expose potential jurors to prejudice and bias against the defendant. Okay, well, it's a high profile case. You're going to find people on that potential jury that have heard about the case. The only legal standard that matters is can the prosecution, the defense and the court, obviously, find 12 jurors who are going to make their decision based upon legal and competent evidence, not what they've heard in the news media. Next, there's been multiple discovery violations by the government. Now, apparently the defense for Lori Val has received some 80,000 documents in this particular case. And apparently, according to this motion, the prosecution has noted that there are more statements of the co-defendant that are out there, and uh, they're still in the process of getting those to the defense. Why this has literally taken three years is beyond me. I'm telling you, if somebody screws this case up, it's going to be the prosecution. I am losing my faith, trust, and confidence the prosecution knows what the heck they're doing at all. I hope they surprise me at trial, but right now they're really starting to look like a bunch of Keystone cops um, trying to figure out. Because according to the defense, they don't even know what they have and what they don't have. It could be Brady material, which is exculpatory information. And if there's a death sentence in this particular case, there's no doubt that the appellate attorneys and the post-conviction attorneys will inevitably find more discovery that hasn't been turned over by the government. And then guess what? We get to do this all over again. So that's the argument there. Um, the next argument, the defendant is mentally ill, and that's known to the court as well as to the government. But this past week, the government apparently submitted an opinion that maybe the defendant wasn't mentally ill, she's just evil. And the defense notes that even if the government's new opinion of the defendant has some believers that the defendant is just evil, we don't kill witches anymore in America. And then next, even if you get the death penalty, Idaho doesn't have the drugs to kill anybody, so why are we even doing this? 
The defense notes that the state of Idaho has, has been trying to kill Gerald Pizzuto, P-I-Z-Z-U-T-O, for the last 35 years. But the Idaho Department of Corrections can't find the drugs so that they can execute him and actually carry out his execution. So now there's new debate in the legislature whereby they will assemble a firing squad, even constructing a new building for human targets. The defense says moral decency certainly can't accept the thought of marching a blindfolded, mentally ill woman in front of a firing squad. Even if the government secures a death verdict for Lori Vallow in this case, the new law won't apply. She will still be subject to the old law. In other words, even if the government is successful in convicting a jury to kill her, it will never happen. I tend to agree um, with the defense on this side, simply the fact that it is going to take forever. Why? We've wasted time because they've turned this into a death penalty case. It could have been tried and over with, well, I'd say over a year ago, but she was in the hospital over a year ago. But, you know, we'd be at least be going forward to a trial. Let's get on with it, people. Let's go. Prosecutors, let's do this thing. Should have been doing what I've been telling you to do all along. What have I been saying? I've prosecution's position should be judge you tell me where you tell me when and we will be ready with our witnesses ready to go to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt to each and every element of the offenses charged and we will convince a jury of the same but instead the prosecution is acting like a bunch of scared little prosecutors who are afraid to go try their case if it's a weak case cut a deal if you have overwhelming evidence then don't cut a deal that's the way it's done Next on the docket, Alec Murdoch's older brother, I don't think believes him. Randy Murdoch has uh, broken his silence for the first time since his younger brother was obviously uh, sentenced for killing his wife and son. And he believes that Alec Murdoch, his brother, is not telling the truth about the brutal murders. Now, Randy Murdoch um, has spent the last uh, two years trying to understand exactly what happened on the night of June 7th when Alec Murdoch's wife, Maggie, and their son, Paul, were killed. He uh, struggles to picture Murdoch, uh, his brother, Alec, uh, pulling the trigger and murdering his wife and child. But he said his younger brother, who has claimed he did not carry out the killing, is a serial liar. He knows more than what he's saying. Uh, Randy Murdoch told the New York Times about these murders. He's not telling the truth, in my opinion, about everything there. Randy, who did not testify in his brother's trial, said after Maggie and Paul were found deceased, he found it strange that Murdoch was not calling people to ask them if they knew why the mother and son might have been targeted. Randy Murdoch said, I spent considerable time day after day for weeks on end calling people saying, why would somebody want to kill them? And he noted that Alec Murdoch never did. Everybody has a different reason to believe why somebody did something. But yes, the behavior afterwards. It's just the way it is. Anyway, despite Murdoch uh, being sentenced to life in prison for the double murder, Randy says he still doesn't know if he thinks his little brother carried out the killings. And he said he still thinks about what happened that night. He says that he hopes that after the trial, because there's been nothing more that could be presented, that I'd stop thinking about this. Randy Murdoch has said he has not spoken to his brother in over a year and that uh, Randy's been uh, forced to question whether he even knows uh, who his brother is at all, literally. Anyway, Maggie and uh, Paul were murdered, obviously, since he found out he was stealing from their law firm in October 21. And Randy Murdoch filed a lawsuit against his uh, brother, claiming that he owed him tens of thousands of dollars. The suit revealed that just days before Murdoch attempted to stage his own murder in that bizarre roadside shooting so that his son Buster would get a $10 million life insurance policy, he came to Randy and asked him for a loan for $75,000. Murdoch apparently asked for the money from his brother and asked it to be deposited in his checking account. He didn't re reveal, Alec Murdoch did not reveal the poor financial condition, but promised that he would repay the money within 30 days. Within days of the loans being made, Murdoch attempted to have himself shot. This way, his surviving son, like I said, gets the money. Anyway, in other Alec Murdoch news, his son Buster is back in the news. So apparently, uh, Buster Murdoch is identified in a police report where he gives his full name, Richard Alec Murdoch, which mirrors his dad's name. And he filed a report with the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office regarding the disturbance after the New York Post published a photo of him 
peeking through the blinds at the Hilton Head Island residence where he obviously resides. The son stated that he was made aware of the photo published in the New York Post that appeared that day, yesterday, and the sheriff investigation began. Buster said he and his girlfriend reviewing ring camera footage from the residence observed a suspicious gray Dodge Challenger outside the residence at approximately 6.39 p.m. The report also described what they took place on the Saturday night. Buster believes the occupants of the vehicle took the photo, judging from uh, Buster's position in the residence when the photo was in fact taken. Authorities said they responded to the uh, complaint by upping patrols outside of the residence, advising Buster on trespass and restraining orders procedures, and providing him with the necessary contact information to take further legal action if warranted. The sheriff's office identified Buster Murdoch as the complainant, but noted his girlfriend, Brooklyn White, also called the sheriff's office to advise she and her boyfriend, Buster, were being followed by the media in a gray Chevrolet SUV. Police said that a corporal tailed the SUV and stopped the drivers for speeding and making an improper lane change. The driver was identified as Nathaniel Ryan Jones. Investigators said that Jones appeared to have a camera bag in the front passenger seat. The individual was only given a traffic violation warning. It, it makes you wonder if Buster Murdoch is uh, destined for a life of appearing on uh, uh, cable news series, uh, maybe Dancing with the Stars or something. Is that where he's headed next? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I feel sorry for Buster or think he's maybe got some involvement in the Stephen Smith thing. I don't know. Obviously, we give everybody the presumption of innocence, right? Except his dad, because his dad has definitely been convicted and said that he stole all that money too. Next on the docket, Letitia Stauk. That's right, three years after 11-year-old Gannis Stauk was killed, his stepmother is set to go to trial in proceedings that are expected to last at least six weeks. How that's gonna take six weeks to prove that case, I do not understand. Anyway, Letitia Stauk faces numerous charges in connection with the death of Gannon Stauk. Back in January of 2020, he was reported missing from the Lorson Ranch neighborhood in El Paso County, Colorado on January 27, 2020. It's the same day that the prosecutors alleged that Stout killed the boy in his bedroom and she has pled not guilty by reason of insanity in the case. And during a court hearing Thursday afternoon, it was revealed the report related to an additional mental health exam requested by the defense team had not yet been provided to the court. As you may recall, Miss Letitia Stauk was arrested in South Carolina back in March of 2020. Later that same month, Gannon's remains were found in a suitcase near a Florida highway. They were found about six weeks after Stauk drove there in a budget rental van. Now, since her arrest, Stauk has been held without bond on felony murder charges, and they include first-degree murder after deliberation, first-degree murder of a person under 12 by someone in a position of trust, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with a deceased human body, tampering with physical evidence, seven counts of crimes of violence for use of a weapon, which include firearm, blunt object, and sharp objects, and one count of crime of violence causing severe bodily injury or death. Jury selection is to begin on March 20th, and they believe it could take two weeks. Hmm. Now, Stauk is also accused of slipping out of handcuffs, attacking a deputy as she was transported from Colorado from South Carolina following her arrest and plotting an escape from the El Paso County Jail. A separate criminal case is pending against her related to those particular incidents. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Take a look at this video. That's right, those are police officers. They're apparently in a house doing an eviction search Whatever the heck that is, I've never heard of such a thing. Anyway, the three police officers thought that they were rummaging through the house and apparently thought that, I don't know, they were entitled to take things. And uh, this police officer, Curtis Trailer Harris, he had a jury trial because he and his co-defendants stole about $10,000 worth of property under the color of authority. Yep, that's right, $10,000. Well, he said he was coerced into taking it, and he knew that he was being videotaped, so he would never be that dumb as to videotape it. Yeah, that's right. The officer thought that her body camera was off. It wasn't. He said, who would be that stupid to steal stuff when you know you're being video recorded? 
That's right. I can tell you, Curtis Trailer Harris and his two co-defendants, that's how stupid you are. Anyway, a, a jury found that um, uh, Mr. Trailer Harris was not coerced and um, actually stole at least $10,000 um, from these residents of the home and that um, he was in a position of power. So you're guilty of theft by one in position of power. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? Jeez. No, it doesn't. In fact, that just sounds dumb. Who would do that? Go through the house as a bunch of police officers serve and protect, right? And they're in there looting someone's home. Looting, literally. Unbelievable. All right, thanks for watching. It's Tuesday. That means we're going to have our Tuesday Night Live show, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Please join us. We'll see you then. Have a wonderful day.